Hey there, in this video series, we're talking about songwriting. And we're talking about songwriting in a fairly unique manner. We're not just sitting down and writing a song with a guitar or a piano or you know one specific instrument. We're writing, recording, we're producing, and we're mixing the song all together in a digital audio workstation. And I'm using Cubase. Now in this specific video, we're going to look at vocal production. So we've already talked about a melody. What makes a good melody? What makes a melody stick in your head? Well, today we're going to look at the actual recording process, which is the melody. And it's not just recording it. Today, we're going to look at taking something that sounds like this. You can be with tearing us apart. Baby, you know, whatever say you say we'll stop. And we're going to look at how to turn it into something that sounds like this. Step away. I don't hear a word you say. It happens every single day. You tell everyone about me. I'm so tired. I wanna get to sleep too. Now that's a pretty big difference. And I've gotta be honest. When you're making a video, you can make anything look good. But when I first sit down in the morning and I've got my chords looped and I'm singing over the top of the chords and the instruments, I don't really know what I'm doing and I sound terrible. So we're going to look at how you can record yourself and you can produce your own vocals to the point where they sound professional. They sound like they can be released. And I'm going to show you some pretty cool tips and tricks and techniques inside of Cubase. One of the most important factors when it comes to vocal production, especially when it's your voice that you're producing, is I guess coming to terms with your own voice, especially if you don't think you're a good singer. And I don't really like the sound of my voice, so I'll put my hand up to not feeling like I'm a great singer. So you can overcompensate for your own vulnerabilities. Um, but the other thing you can do is use a few techniques to, I guess, beef up your vocals. And of course, one of them is using pitch correction, especially if you find it hard to pitch a particular line. The other thing you can do is use a layering technique. So that's using more than one version of your own vocal line. And usually it's taking one specific vocal line and it's singing that two to three to four times and lining them up so that they sound like they're in time with each other and in pitch with each other and then you can start to really suck them out and add width to your vocal sound doubling up a vocal is a pretty well used effect when it comes to making a vocal sound a lot bigger so you can double your vocals up and then of course there's the vocal chain so the vocal chain is basically the signal path as your vocal goes through the door. So it comes in, we can put it on a channel. We can then use a bunch of different vocal channels and send it through to a group channel. And then we can start adding effects to that. And then finally it comes out of the master output with all the rest of our track. So when it comes to vocal production, it helps to think of your vocals as just, you know, think of your whole entire mix, your whole production as being this picture from top to bottom. Up the top, we've got high. Down the bottom, we've got low. And everywhere in between are all of these instruments that we've got around us that we've used in our production. Your job when it comes to vocal production is just finding that spot for your vocals. I don't hear a word you say. One of the very first things I do when it comes to vocal production is to ensure that I have everything edited so everything's under control. So I zoom in, I get my range tool, and I start to highlight areas where the vocalist isn't singing. Now, it might help to turn the snap to grid off so that you can basically start and end this range selection wherever you want. And it makes it really quick. You can do multiple takes or channels at once if the vocalist is singing the same thing. Next up, it's making sure that we've got these edits spot on. So you can see here, it's not exactly starting right where the vocals come in. And now I'm just going to highlight them both. And I'm just going to fade in and fade out just ever so slightly. And that will basically mean that there's no breath noises or there's no obscure noises before the vocalist starts singing. And all that I have on this track is the vocalist singing. Look, if you've forgotten to do it, 
in a particular section of your song, then you know just do it while you're listening back to a track. So in effect, you're doing two things at once. Visually, you're making sure that everything's tidy and you're actually listening to your vocal line at the same time. And even if you haven't done this in the past, it is really important to do it moving forwards because you might pick up on some techniques that I'm showing you in this video in terms of adding dynamics or adding processing over the top of these vocals. And your effects won't miss these clicks and pops and artifacts. So it is important to try and remember to do this every time. It will soon become a really good habit and a good practice. Once you've finished editing your vocals into different segments, and these segments are usually one vocal phrase, then you can turn on lanes. And that's where you can see all of your takes and you can start to select the best take. I don't hear a word just now I'm hitting the solo button on the left hand side in the track list to solo each of my takes. And this is where I guess we should start thinking right from the start, before we start recording vocals, what makes a good take? Well, in theory, I'd always write off, you know, the first dozen takes that I actually record. And that's because I'm not a singer. You should always record them, but usually I'm, I'm trying to figure the melody out. So there's no point even looking at them until I've actually got the melody in my head. And let's remember that we're writing this as we're recording it. So once the melody starts to take shape and I've got my lyrics sorted out, then I start focusing on things like pitch. Can I get my pitch to a decent, I guess, standard before I start to pitch shift it later on? Then I'm looking at things like note length. So am I holding that note for, I guess, the right amount? Or does holding it for that amount not suit me because, you know, my vocals aren't that good and I technically can't hold a note for that length. So this is where it all changes. We're not necessarily working with the best singer. We're working within our own capabilities. So this is a really, really important point when it comes to recording your own voice. Understand your limits, understand what you're good at, and try and make your takes work to your strengths. In a perfect world, we can have pitch, which is as close to perfect as we demand or as we want. So, of course, if you notice something's a little bit out, then you've got very audio inside Cubase right there at the touch of a mouse button. And you can very quickly go in and use very audio to edit away. Everything that I'm doing here in terms of comping or editing all of these vocal takes is basically the search for the perfect take. Now you might have nailed the perfect take. So whenever you're happy with your lead vocal take, then you can start to think about whether you're going to introduce vocal doubling and where are you going to introduce vocal doubling? So I've left it out of my first verse altogether and I've brought it in here. Wanna get to sleep tonight. I've dropped the vocal doubling for the last phrase of that second verse. I don't want to cause anyone to skimp on these vocals or to become lazy, but you can be a little more relaxed with the actual perfectionism when it comes to vocal double takes. Because they're further back in the mix, you can implement more pitch correction and more timing corrections to make sure that they're in sync with each other and, of course, most importantly, with the lead vocal. Okay, so when I get to my chorus, it's time to take the melody somewhere else. So I'm introducing a new vocal double, an octave higher. So I've recorded two parts, which is exactly mimicking the lead vocal, just up higher. And I'm using the quick link function in the mix console to move these faders up and down to try and find a balance and just see if it's going to work. In the second half of the chorus, I've introduced two harmony parts, which I'm not doubling. They're just one part each. And now it's a matter of seeing if they balance with everything else. Stop believing all the things you say about me I know it ain't easy on you to 
We gotta set ourselves. The great thing about recording like this is you can record and capture ideas on the fly. But one thing I will say is you need to go back and revisit these ideas because your initial ideas are likely to be out of tune and not perfect. So one thing that I do know is that now I need to go back and either re-record these vocals or see what I can do with a good couple of hours of editing the pitch and the note length just to see if I can tidy it all up enough so that when I solo it, it sounds good. Now to get a really tight vocal sound, we can highlight two parts or three parts or four parts and open them all up in very audio, which is so cool because it means now I can see these two unison parts that I have here and I can do things like edit the start and the end point for each individual note as it's sung on each individual take. And I can also go in and I can edit the pitch. Now, I don't tighten the pitch up perfectly. The timing, yes, I try and have that as tight as I can. But if I get the pitch too perfect across these unison takes, I get this weird phasey type of sound and it starts to sound quite synthetic. So it's up to you to decide how much of this you want to use. Now, this is a killer feature inside of Cubase. I'm not sure how many other doors have this built in, but the ability to be able to edit multiple vocal parts at the one time in the one window is a game changer in terms of you know vocal editing workflow. Here's a great example of it. I've opened up the two harmony parts that I use in the second half of the chorus. And now I can go from part to part. You can see the upper part are the blocks at the top and the lower parts, the blocks underneath. And I can go through and once again, make sure that these harmonies make sense independently. And of course, make sense together. Now that we've got all our housekeeping done in terms of editing, let's go and have a look at a few things that we can put over the top of these vocals to add warmth and ambience. And of course, keep them more controlled from a dynamic perspective. And that don't say a thing about me. One thing that I always do before mixing is assign a group channel to each important vocal part. And in this case, you can see that I highlight a channel and I just say add group channel to selected track. I've done that for all of my backing vocals as well. And up here on the output routing, you can see that they're assigned to their own group channel. All of these backing vocal tracks are basically a chorus. So they don't need a whole lot of treatment before they get sent to the group track. So the only thing I'm doing is adding some light compression so that the levels are all constant and they're the same. Once again, I'm controlling the mix by controlling the levels. And I've added a little bit of EQ just to take out some of the lower mids. Now that I'm reasonably happy with the level of all of those individual parts, I can pretty much just go and focus on this group fader, which basically controls the level for all of the backing vocals. Let's now go and take a look at some typical inserts that you would add over the top of a vocal group channel. And this relates both to the lead vocal and of course to the backing vocals. So when I bring up the channel overview window, I can see that I've got three inserts here. I've got a compressor, a de-esser, and I've got an EQ. So this is just treating the group vocals. The compressor is controlling the level. So it's controlling the level of all of these backing vocals. And as I move that threshold down, I start to see the compressor kicking into gear. It doesn't need a whole lot of compression, but once again, it's about controlling it. A de is very similar to a compressor, except that it's working across a frequency area which we define and select. The whole point of a de is to remove harsh or sibilant sounds. And a sibilant sound is that kind of sound. And if you're noticing that your S's are really coming through, then try a de -esser. In fact, I would almost use a de over every vocal recording. And you can use a preset and then go in and edit the area which you want the de to reduce. I tend to add ambient effects on their own effects channel, and then I create sends to the effects channels. Now you can see all of my sends that I have here on my vocal channels, and one of those sends is not going to an ambient plugin. It's going to distortion. And I've added a few different types of distortion here to give you some idea of how you can use distortion to help it poke through. To believe I'm the villain in the paper. You telling everybody there. This guy is called Magneto, and Magneto gives us this really nice old school tape based saturation, which is really distorting harmonics over the top of our track. This plugin is a really simple and effective plugin for adding distortion over the top of vocals. Feeling in 
It's made by waves and it's relatively cost effective. And basically, all you do is move the knob around until you find something that you like. Let's just have a listen to this in context behind the whole entire track. That's a really cool sound and it's just adding this grit to those backing vocals. And the challenge is to find the right place or the right sweet spot in the one knob plugin, but also to find the right level in our fader down the bottom. Because as we increase the fader, we're increasing this distorted sound into the overall mix. Another amazing plugin to add distortion and warmth to vocals is Quadrifuzz, and it's a multi-band plugin that does more than I can explain in 20 seconds. Let's have a listen. <laughs> It adds this beautiful warmth and it's a far more complex sound and look, there's far more than you can do in Quadrafuzz and almost any other distortion effect. I want to show you a really cool technique for controlling things like delays and reverbs. So I've got a reverb channel here and in the insert slot I've got Revelation, that's my reverb, and I've got just a stock standard Cubase compressor which is happily compressing away on the channel there. Now if I go to my lead vocal, you can see all of the effects sends that I have set up. So my effects include delays, reverbs, and there's a couple of other mystery sends there which we're just going to investigate right now. So if I open up these sends, you can see that I can very easily have a send to my reverb channel and that's as we would normally set up an effects channel but further down the bottom I've actually got a side chain send set up which is sending a signal to this compressor which is sitting below the reverb insert in the reverb channel and I've got this side chain button activated and with that side chain button activated that compressor is now receiving the signal from the vocal channel which is controlling when this compressor is activated. So when the signal comes through to the compressor, it compresses the reverb sound, dropping the volume on it. And that allows our vocals to come through without reverb. Once the vocals stop on that track, then it allows the reverb to come through. So basically, it's creating space for the lead vocal. I'm just going to exaggerate this, and it's not gonna sound great, but it's going to give you an idea of what's actually happening. So you could really hear that reverb pushing in after the vocal. And once again, that's with a really high threshold just for demonstration purposes. But feel free to use this technique on anything ambient just to create room for your lead vocals to stick through without being, you know, clouded by big reverbs and big delays. Finally, in terms of EQ, there are so many great presets in this frequency plugin, which once again comes inside of Cubase. And it even includes things like different notch points where we can go through and find troublesome frequencies by dragging it up and I guess boosting the frequencies. And once we've found the troublesome frequencies, we can drop them down and remove them from the actual channel we're mixing. The other thing is make sure you always put a low cut over the top of your vocals. It's almost impossible to decide on an EQ setting for your vocals before you've mixed a track. Although it is something which you will develop the more you mix vocals, you'll just get a ballpark idea going on in your head. And of course, we're going to deal with mixing this track in a later video. So in this video, we've taken a good look at vocal production, like how to treat the lead vocal and how to add all of these other, I guess, uh, vocal layers into our production. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the rest of the production. So all of the instruments that we have around us, how do we fit all of them in so that it all fits together with the vocal production into one really nice sonic landscape. Thanks for taking the time to stop by and check out this video, please. Give us a thumbs up if you've learned something and subscribe to the Cubase YouTube channel for plenty more videos just like this. I'll see you in the next video. You're telling everybody.